Now, you remember from last week that we're in the moment of phasing out of the 1960s, uh, moving into the 1970s. But of course, human actions, inactions, chronology is not simply as neat as dates on a, on a calendar, as a timeline. A lot of the social confusion and violence and um, cultural excitement, actually, of this era, of the late 60s, is right there in the 1970s. And uh, this lecture is actually trying to canvas some of the political turmoil and its, its marriage to um, popular culture in the early 1970s. By way of context, though, <coughs> let me start in the spring of 1970. On April 30th, and actually, let me focus, frankly, just focus on two weeks in 1970. On April 30th, President Nixon <coughs> announces the invasion of Cambodia, the escalation of the war in Southeast Asia in general, and the need for 150,000 more troops to find a lasting peace. In response, a campus at Kent State in Ohio, the ROTC building set on fire. The Ohio governor dispatches National Guard to make sure the campus remains peaceful. On a May 4th, this attempt to keep the peace on Kent State evaporates when 28 guardsmen open fire on Kent State students, killing four and wounding nine. Immediately, immediately being a day, 500 colleges are shut down across the country or they're disrupted from protests. Our country, according to college protesters, our country is now attacking us. Makes tremendous headlines. On May 14th, 10 days after, bless you, 10 days after Kent State, at Jackson State University, historically black university, during a student protest, state and highway patrolmen opened fire with automatic weapons into dormitories. Allegations are that someone was sniping at them. No evidence was ever found to that, to that end. They opened fire without any warning, killed two students, wounded nine. The scale of national attention is not commensurate with what happens at Kent State. So for in the African American community, there is a sense that the police state, in this case state and highway patrolmen, could kill our college students without anybody worrying too much. But at Kent State, also inexcusable, they could kill the students and it becomes a national catastrophe. Meanwhile, in New Haven, just about two blocks from here, well, actually all throughout New Haven. The Black Panther Party and the FBI are at a standoff. Black Panther Party and fellow travelers had come to New Haven essentially to protest the murder trial of Bobby Seale, who's accused of authorizing the murder of Alex Rackley, a member of the Black Panther Party, people believed to have been an informant to the FBI. 15,000 people descend upon the green. Panthers, Panther supporters, uh, sort of anarchist hippies called the Yippies, by, led by Abby Hoffman, fellow travel, travelers of all sorts. And there's a real fear that the city is going to be collapsed into a race riot. The university, under the leadership of Kingman Brewster, the president at the time, does something that people never expected and actually opened its doors to the Black Panthers. Created a mechanism, it felt, Brewster felt, that would relieve some of the, the pent-up anxiety and tension over what's happening around the country and then locally. Classes are canceled, there's student strikes. I think two or three pipe bombs go off at Ingalls Rink. It's a level of chaos that, you, that that you are not familiar with. 
King and Brewster declares that he actually doubts, and I'm paraphrasing here, whether a black person can get a fair trial anywhere in America. Immediately, the alums start phoning in, calling for his resignation, for his outlandish statement. It's a national event, student unrest, it's a local story as well. In this spirit of what's going on in the country on the college campuses, in the nation with the call for federal troops, uh, excuse me, for more military troops, invasion of Cambodia, you have an astonishing, almost sort of a call and response by a lot of uh, cultural artists. Most famous in this regard, well, most famous to me, at least in this regard, is Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye, who had made a career at Motown by uh, piecing together and performing love songs, branches out a year later in May of 1971 with something really quite different. So he's known for, for this. I mean, really catchy love songs, really quite, you know, they're actually important in the history of um, the evolution of rock music and the Motown sound. But by get, when we get into 1970, Gay is wrestling with, uh, well, partly exhaustion from churning out these um, saccharine-laden songs but also he's wrestling with what's going on in the country. And he wants to aspire to do something quite different. And he earns, secures for himself a new contract with Motown, and he's given creative license, which is astonishing. This is the big sort of rupture of Motown. He's given creative license. And he, turn, and he generates a concept album. The album's called What's Going On. It's dealing with Vietnam, it's dealing with uh, economic uh, in, uh, despair with incredible inflation going on in the country. He's dealing with ecological despair, and this is a few years before um, Earth Day would actually take effect, but people are wondering what we're doing to this particular planet. In fact, I've often, when I've given this uh, lecture, as I once, I mean, I hadn't given a, a cultural politics lecture for years, and I finally realized it was time to do so, and I listened to what's going on just to see if I wanted to play a clip, and I realized I could actually just put the CD on, leave the room, have you guys understand the 19, early 1970s by the time the album is over. Um, but, well, I had to get up and say something. Um, <laughs> so you have a moment of escalating war in Vietnam, fear of, of the destruction of the planet, e ecologically speaking, environmentally speaking, hyperinflation in the United States, poverty, urban decay, And Marvin Gaye starts writing these pieces, or produces these songs. They merge one into another in what's going on. And in fact, if you do want to learn what the 90s said, just go out and, I used to say, buy the album at the record store, then you could buy the CD, and now it's just, you know, go to iTunes, I suppose. Um, <coughs> although you should patronize Cutler's, the local record store. Um, <laughs> the, um, in one of his, Signature songs from the album, what's, what's Happening, Brother? It's a story of a returning vet, comes back from Vietnam, trying to figure out what is happening on the street, really trying to get back into the mundane routine of life. I'll play a clip of it.
If you have the lyric sheet in front of you, it's self-evident. For those of you who don't, guy's just come back from war. He's wondering if he's reading in the newspaper if what he's reading is true, and he's talking about civil rights here. Are things actually getting better? Can't find a job, though. Money is tight. I don't understand what's going on around here. And then just wondering, you know, are they still doing the stuff they used to do? Going to the dances. Do you think anybody has a chance to succeed, in this case a ball club? I want to know what's going on, what's happening. Someone who's lost and trying to find his way. Very soon you get an answer in the same album, in the song Inner City Blues, hearkening back to Gil Scott Heron, Whitey on the Moon. Sending people to the moon, spending on people who don't have anything, please, instead. People taking all of our money. This is exactly Gil Scott Heron's lament from the same era. He closes the song, throwing up both my hands in a lament. Now, if you think I'm stretching this a little bit, I mean, this is just one album after all, let me share with you a, a personal story. It's happening in 1971, 72, and 73. I was too young to remember it, actually. But in 1990, let me think, what would this have been? 1997 or so, I was living in Los Angeles. My father and mother come to visit me and my wife. And we're driving, we go out to, he lived in LA for a while when, during this era, we drive out to visit some old friends of his in Los Angeles and have a great night. Come back, we're driving back, and I happen just to put on this album, I listen to it all the time. He and my mother riding in the back seat, and after a while I realized what I, I, something doesn't sound quite right. And then I realized what I'm hearing in the back seat is weeping. I mean, flat out weeping. I turn down the music, ask what's going on, and my father just says, I can't, you know, I just can't talk. I can't talk about it. Get back to the house. I've never seen this guy cry in my entire life. So I don't know what, what has actually happened sit down with him, and my mother says, Wendell, just tell him what's going, what happened there. And my father essentially had flashback. He was a Vietnam vet himself, fought, fought, uh, flew in the Air Force, and he sang that album. It just brought everything back. I mean, you just, don't, you just don't understand, he tells me, what it was like. People going off and trying to risk, or risking their lives for the country and being treated the way they were treated upon their return, and Marvin Gaye really understood it, the sense of confusion that many people, not just vets, but certainly in his case, vets come back trying to figure out what is going on in this country. What do they actually fight for? Feeling a sense of moral confusion as well. My father even talked about the, you know, the economy and the ecological landscape all in that same moment. He goes, that album really captured it all. Marvin Gaye understood what was going on. Now this album, What's Going On, fluctuates between an international critique and also things happening in U.S. cities. Again, this economic despair, I keep coming back to it, it's really one of the defining elements of the time. You also have, during this moment, this 
rise of, uh, in, in line with the Black Panther Party, certainly, this rise of a celebration of, of black masculinity, black virility, and also um, black cultural celebration. Quite a different one than the Harlem Renaissance, certainly, but a black cultural celebration is um, all the same. Take these elements together, sort of this culturally rich moment, the notion of um, abiding economic troubles, and also the determination that we, in this case the black man, and I use that phrase quite intentionally, are going to turn the system over. We're going to be something different. You end up with an incredibly popular movie and character. The character's name is John Shaft, the movie is Shaft. I'll play for you some lyrics, show you a clip, and then explain a bit of what is actually happening in this piece. Every year when I play this, I forget to do a vocal boost because the lyrics, Isaac Hayes' voice is so deep um, that you lose out in the lyrics. Who's the, pri who's the black private dick that's a sex machine to all the chicks? I'm supposed to say Shaft. Um, <laughs> you're damn right. Who is the man that would risk his neck for his brother man? Thank you. <laughs> Can you dig it? Who's the cat that won't cop out when there's danger all about? Shaft. Right on. You see, this cat is, this shaft is a bad mother, but I'm talking about shaft. <laughs> All right, you get it. Um, anyway, I mean, it is, it is humorous to, especially when <laughs> looking like this and being what I am and singing this song. Um, <laughs> but, but, the song was incredibly important. Isaac Hayes breaks out as well out of the Motown sort of trap and comes out with this album that electrifies people. He's talking about a kind of individual they had not seen before, they had not been around before. And then the movie comes out. I mean, this was the soundtrack to the movie. See, so walking through New York Times Square, which used to be a complete um, cesspool. I'll fix it.
Now, I played the extended clip here. There's a couple of moments that are rather important. One is just the street scene that Shaft is walking through. New York City, Times Square is not the place you've come to know with its, with its sort of carnival atmosphere. Um, it was a place of, uh, you know, triple X movie theaters, um, prostitutes, drug use and such. And John Shaft comes up, emerges in this landscape and walks through it a man on a mission. 34 seconds into this clip, into the start of the movie, uh, you may have seen it or not, I don't know if the lights were down enough yet for you, but he crosses the street and someone comes up about to hit him, he stops the car and gives him the finger. You know, in the grand scheme of things, especially the what we see today in our movies and our YouTube clips, this, is, this doesn't even register. This was a mind-blowing moment in American cinema in <laughs> when this movie comes out. The black man walking through a place like he owns it, giving the finger to a white guy in a car. And he continues walking. He's walking through his long leather black coat, certainly reminiscent of the Panthers, but he looks a little bit different. And it turns out, when this guy tries to sell him a hot timepiece, that he's a cop. So the question is, who's the man? And it turns out, yeah, thank you. <laughs> well played, yes. Um, that Shaft is the man. He's virile, he's masculine. As the lyrics say, he's a complicated man. Um, and so you have a new kind of visual representation of blackness, bless you. Now Shaft is one of the, the um, finer productions of a, of a cultural um, moment in cinema called black Blaxploitation. Pardon me, I have to multitask a little bit here. Black exploitation begins in 1971. Begins all, you know, all in this moment. Begins with a movie, really an art piece, by a man named Melvin, Melvin Van Peebles. The movie's called Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. The movie is, um, I find it very difficult to watch, just from the kind of messages it's giving and also because it's cinematic qualities and because it's in some way, well, I don't care for the movie. But anyway, it's incredibly important. It starts with the unnamed narrator, or protagonist, I suppose, see him being raised by prostitutes, he becomes a hustler, he gives witness to a moment of pol police brutality, he kills a bad cop, and because he committed one of the ultimate offenses, he has to go on the run. And the movie is essentially, it's a flight movie. He's going through all these different scenes. trying to keep one step in front of the man. And the man, as it turns out in this case, is powerfully corrupt. <coughs> it's a lot of power, but that power has corrupted him. And you see Melvin Van Peebles, he's the lead in his own movie, you know, going through, I mean, any kind of slice of life you can imagine, um, representing the 1970s. Um, drug use, sex scenes, pimping, prostitution, crime, always trying to stay one step in front of the man. And the movie becomes an inspiration for the formula that becomes black exploitation. It's a movie that, that dismisses assimilation, that declares the systems corrupt. It is a reflection of black power militancy, no matter what, it's a counter to white hegemony. This is how you could characterize most of the black exploitation films. There are wrinkles, we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to play for you one of the last few clips. Of the movie. What you're seeing here, it, it's a, it's a strange close-up, the camera looking down in a shallow creek, 
panning up to see uh, to see a um, a gutted a gutted police dog that had come to hunt down um, the narrator. You see it from a slightly comfortable distance, and again, it's a, it's a movie that's about flight. That's enough of that movie. Um, it's actually hard to watch because of the dissonance and the rough film quality. Well, the movie shot on a $500,000 budget, shot in the course of two weeks, has an all black crew. So it's giving a message about sort of a non-assimilationist black pride, and it's actually doing it as well. And the movie, oh, and I think it aspires for an X rating, which had a different connotation in the early 70s than it does now, because that way we can get outside of the union system and then have an all-black crew. Shot for 500 grand grosses two million, ten million dollars, excuse me, ten million dollars. Tremendous return on investment. And this is what really launches this five-year period of the genre. They are often low budget, Shaft being really an ex uh, um, a different creature in this regard, it's a high budget film. Most of them are low budget, they make a ton of money, the production values aren't that wonderful, they're mostly action films, they're very simplistic in its construction, black is good, white is black, bad, they are hyper-masculine, and they are misogynist. So when people think about black exploitation, is it about black identity, about a certain kind of blackness? Is it about cultural production? Or was it a co-opted capitalist venture? After Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, most of the black exploitation fil films become studio productions. No matter what you decide black exploitation is, it's important to think about the images that it presents. They all weren't about revolutionaries or tough, upstanding men. They're about different kinds of people. Play a clip from. the movie um, Superfly as a way to access this particular part of the narrative. So this is a song you know, celebrating a pusher. I'm your mom, I'm your daddy, I'm that nigger in the alley. I'm your doctor when in need, want some coke, have some weed. You know me, I'm your friend, your main boy, thick and thin. So who is the pusher man? Play the opening montage from 
Superfly. Main character is getting out of his car. That is the main lead character right there. Yes, you are seeing the camera cord in the clips. The filmmakers didn't need a set, they had New York City to use as its perfect backdrop. So I played this extended clip the same way I played Shaft. I mean, these moves are coming out at essentially the same time, but they're telling quite a different story. Walking through different parts of New York City, certainly. Shaft walking with power and authority since he is the man. And the pusher man doing something really entirely quite different. Still, also walking through New York City and its economic sites of economic devastation. Right before this clip, you see the pusher man getting out of bed. He has, as the lyrics from the Curtis Mayfield song, The Baddest Bitches in the Bed, getting out of bed with a white woman, which is of course important for all the racial narratives about that kind of coupling possibility, living in a very fancy apartment, and he's really trying to get out. He's made enough money he's trying to get out of the system, and then he's got to get these petty thieves who are trying to take some of his, his dope. The story is then about a pusher man trying to exit the high life. He's going to make one final score and retire. But as, he, as the story goes through, he discovers that the people who are actually the drug pens, kingpins in New York City, the ones he has to make this final score with, are the police. The commissioner of the police is the biggest kingpin, drug kingpin in the city. And the pusher man comes to the heroic conclusion by framing or setting up the police commissioner. So you have here perhaps a hero, perhaps an anti-hero. It's really quite unclear. But you certainly, I mean, in terms of what's being celebrated here. But you certainly have the lingering part of black exploitation that, that the man, when it is the white man, not John Shaft, of course, the man, usually a person in great authority, structurally in the system, is the cause of degradation in the black community. Now, I've talked about the fact that 
that black exploitation is celebrating manhood and of a complicated nature. It's also doing something quite different. You know, people often point to Pam Greer as um, a wonderful example of a black exploitation film star. You know, she's always um, winning in the end. Her first movies in this regard, Foxy Brown. It's a story about Foxy. Her brother is set up by a drug kingpin. This is one of the great narratives of black exploitation. Her boyfriend is killed by the man, and she's going to infiltrate the mob to exact her revenge. And the way she infiltrates it is becoming a prostitute. In fact, the beginning of the movie, before this stuff un un unwinds, you have Pam Greer getting out of bed with the phone ring. Phone rings, and within a few seconds, she's bare chested. I mean, this is what black exploitation and white and, and female power is suggested by Pam Greer. Her sexuality is her power. Anyway, I want to play the last couple of minutes from Foxy Brown. It has a twist on this narrative of who's the man, in fact, how black power is interwoven in this in interesting ways. <laughs> What you're seeing here is the drug kingpin's um, boyfriend being stopped. Black mobsters have taken over, posing as the police, now they've caught him. This is the drug kingpin, as it turns out. The person behind Foxy Brown's boyfriend's murder, her brother, her brother being set up as well. The alarm's been tripped.
I know. That's the idea. The rest of your boyfriend is still around. And I hope you two live a long time. And then maybe you get to feel what I feel. Death is too easy for you, bitch. I want you to suffer. So, you have in this clip justice being exacted along the terms that in the black black exploitation vernacular made the most sense. But still, what kind of messages are being offered here? And when you were in the movie theater, I mean, the production value, the acting, such you know, in the, the gun being pulled out of the afro, um, these are all humorous. Um, but in the movie theater. So moments of celebration. This is a whole different kind of cultural logic that people had not seen before, not on a screen, and they wanted to celebrate it. It's an era of great struggle for the nation, truly. We're still not out of that moment. And you'd see it articulated with its great cultural products of the age. It's a moment of despair. It's despair that's certainly likely what, it's what urged Stevie Wonder to write some of the most socially conscious lyrics of the era. And, and these are, you won't be surprised, these are not the ones that are heard on the radio when people play back, you know, Stevie Wonder reflections. Wonder had negotiated a new contract, just like Marvin Gaye had done before, that broke him out of the studio system in Motown. And, re and the result was about a six-year cycle of albums that was nothing short of astonishing. I mean, one, that the albums are released. So many are released in just a five-year window. Actually, just a four-year window when you think about it. Um, albums are Music of My Mind in 1972. He's only 21 years old. Talking Book released the same year in 72. Inner Visions released in 73. Fulfillingness's first finale in 74. Songs in the Key of Life in 76. This is not the little Stevie Wonder of... Um, and he's coming out with Motown with the, I forget the name of the song, playing his harmonica, um, uh, but a Motown sort of dance tune. This is not the Stevie Wonder in later years of, you know, don't drive drunk fame. This is Stevie Wonder of a different kind of political vintage. You can hear it here in his song, Big Brother. <laughs> Your name is Big Brother You say that you got me all in your muggle Writing it down every day Your name is I'll see Your name you. is I'll see you I'll change if you vote me in as a friend I live in the ghetto You just come to visit me Round election time Hi. The sound quality is much better. I had the settings off in this. I apologize. But in the song itself, he's going on. You know, I live in the ghetto. Someday I'll move my feet to the other side. My name is secluded. We live in a house the size of a matchbox. Roaches live with us wall to wall. 
concludes the song with, you've killed all our leaders. I don't even have to do nothing to you. You'll cause your own country to fall. This is a different kind of Stevie Wonder, of course. Now, Wonder is using lyrics that are call and response to Jesse Jackson. Now, we've not talked about Jesse Jackson pretty much at all in this course. I'll be talking about him, I think, next week. But Jackson has made a name for himself <coughs> with the famous call and response, I am somebody. I am, and the audience says somebody, trying to boost up in these rallies, sort of a notion of self-esteem. And Wonder saying, no, my name is nobody. My name is secluded. Credible economic violence and despair. You've killed all of our leaders. I don't have to do nothing to you to cause your own country to fall. The nation is going to collapse in upon itself. So you have then across in the early years of the 1970s, and this lecture is really focused on about four years, three years, three or four years in the 1970s, a moment of incredible cultural production, but of a type that sends, well, a range of messages, I suppose. It's talking about black virility, at a moment of rising black feminism, which we'll be talking about on Wednesday, sends very interesting message, interesting in quotes, interesting not in a good way, messages about the role of the black woman. Still wrestling with tensions over who the man is, what the man looks like, what the man does, who's to be blamed for the excesses, and it sends profoundly confusing messages about the cultural celebration of people who are putting drugs into a community and destroying that community. As you walk out, I'll be playing Village Ghetto Land from Wonder in 1976. He was inviting people to come with him down to his dead-end street to Village Ghetto Land. And you see the people lock their doors with robbers laugh and steal, beggars watch and eat their meals from garbage cans. I think I missed a lyric, a line there. Broken glasses everywhere, it's a bloody scene. Killing plagues, that plagues the citizens, unless they own police. Not the most uplifting lecture I know, but this is the cultural moment of the early 1970s. We'll overlap when we start talking about black feminism uh, in the same moment and see a series of conflicting messages about blackness in the early 1970s. Class is over. Would you like to go with me down my dead end street? Would you like to come with me to village ghetto land?